time. Uh, so people say, well, you showed all that and this is good, but what about real age-related diseases? Can you treat that? So we, we address that issue. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there isn't any more uh, famous age-related disease than Alzheimer's disease. It may not be the most common, but certainly it's the most talked about. Uh, and uh, it turns out that it is common. One of, in, uh, of every 10 people has Alzheimer's disease. And uh, it, it is predicted that uh, by 2060, 14 million people will have Alzheimer's disease. So it's not, it's not uncommon. And as you know, it's a very unpleasant disease. Uh, and it uh, costs enormous amounts of money to any healthcare system, including ours in the United States. The prevailing theory of the cause of Alzheimer's disease is chronic inflammation, which causes the accumulation of a substance called beta amyloid into the blood. It uh, crosses the blood brain barrier and it deposits in the, in the brain, causes typical plaques. And uh, it is believed that these plaques cause the dementia in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Enormous amounts of money has been spent to develop drugs to, to, against the beta amyloid. Uh, and uh, all of them have failed. Uh, I don't know if you follow the medical literature, but the FDA recently approved, approved a very controversial drug. And uh, the FDA now is being attacked by everybody, including Congress. Uh, for approval of a drug without zero evidence that it works. In fact, 42% of the patients in the clinical trial develop side effects related to bleeding in the brain. Uh, so giving patients with brain disease, brain hemorrhage, I thought was not a nice approach to treatment of this disease. And in addition to that is enormously expensive. Uh, we had performed a randomized controlled clinical trial with real plasma exchange versus placebo or called so-called champhoresis. And uh, uh, we treated 496 patients in different hospitals for 14 months. Uh, and what we observed is that we treated two groups of patients, one with mild Alzheimer's disease, the other with moderately severe disease. In the moderately severe disease, 67% of the patients, uh, in the patients, we observed the arrest of the progression of the disease, which was very important as opposed to the placebo. Interestingly enough, in the mild group, we were able to arrest the disease in 100% of the patients that we treated, which uh, uh, arguably suggests that we may be able to prevent the disease. And uh, if we look at the financials of this, uh, our study is considered, our approach is considerably less expensive than the newly approved, the newly approved medication. So I think that we are in a much better position to treat patients with Alzheimer's disease than anything else available at the moment. Our second paper with secondary endpoints, which is the clinical uh, neuropsychiatric results of the study has been accepted for publication and will be published hopefully within the next month or so. Uh, there are some interesting autoimmune syndromes that are uh, becoming more and more commonly diagnosed and respond to, to our treatment. One of them is PANDAS which stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Streptococcal Infection. So interestingly enough, the majority of these diseases that are on this list uh, happen after certain infection. It may be streptococcal infection, maybe, maybe uh, the new co coronaviruses that uh, caused this, uh, this pandemic of the last two years. So, I don't want to get deep into this, but there is, a, there is certainly a, a very significant association between infection uh, and, and autoimmunity. And it is believed because of cross-reactivity of antigens and antibodies. So if you're interested, I can expand on that, but it's, it's complicated. Uh, 
<clears throat> so these kids are suffered tr tremendously. I, I've been treating over the last few months a young uh, man who just he couldn't talk. He had OCD. He uh, he is just very very unpleasant. They do not function properly, and uh, they have incontinence. So they have to go to school if they ever can get to school uh, with precautions and stuff. So uh, this this kid that that were I treated him today actually uh, is doing much better now and he can go to school and play with his friends. Uh, took ACT, ACT, ACT uh, took his exams uh, lately and is applying for college. So we have good response in this particular disease. Autoimmune encephalitis, they actually, these are different encephalopathies uh, that are becoming more common. Either we didn't know how to diagnose them in the past or, or just they're becoming more uh, prominent now. It, it's tough to say, but we see a lot of those. Uh, something that emerged over the last year is the so-called long haul COVID. So patients who have been infected and develop the full-blown disease after they recover, they have symptoms that last for a long period of time. Uh, one of the most significant symptoms they have is profound fatigue. They, they can't move properly. They, they're always sleepy and they have foggy memories. It's just very unpleasant. Uh, this syndrome resembles chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, uh, we call it today myalgic encephalomyelitis. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but that's the new term here. And uh, uh, we see some of that and I'll show you in a second. And uh, unfortunately we also see uh, syndromes that are definitely autoimmune that occur after vaccination. So it, it's difficult to, to say that the vaccine caused that, but the, the similarities in, in, these, in these syndromes uh, in many patients, it's almost immediately after, after vaccination, about a week later, uh, speaks to, to a very plausible you know, uh, association. And these can be really very severe, very unpleasant. Transverse myelitis is uh, really a very serious neurologic disease. Uh, there is a new kind of TTP related syndrome. There is catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, <clears throat> myocarditis, you have heard on the news about myocarditis. And uh, <clears throat> the encephalomyelitis that occurs in long COVID can occur in post vaccine vaccination people. Uh, this is by no means to say that I do not endorse vaccines, just the opposite. I think that they have saved lives. I think that we should be careful <clears throat> in some people who uh, may be predisposed for the development of these syndromes and be careful not to do that. And there are other approaches to cause to, to create uh, passive immunity rather than active immunity, which is the vaccine. So the vaccines uh, have been very successful and will continue to be successful. Uh, these are some, some cautionary notes here. <clears throat> so this is the plasma here on the left hand side where it says before TPE is the plasma from a patient with long haul COVID. As you can see, it's darker, it's not transparent. Uh, it's murky. And uh, on the right hand side, this is the plasma after two treatments. As you can see here, this is the normal plasma, which is uh, clear, clean, transparent, uh, and has the right, the right color. Uh, and this is what the patient has to say. I came to uh, Kiprov's office three weeks after I had finished the uh, uh, hospital. Uh, Stay when I came here about an half ago and did the first apheresis, I couldn't walk off of an airplane without uh, collapsing into a wheelchair. The day after the uh, apheresis, it was as if I had a different body 
and uh, no longer were my lungs an issue for breathing uh, as I was starting to get a life back again. Um, and uh, the difference was uh, was truly remarkable. COVID was that I had, did lose my sense of smell, uh, my ability to taste. Um, my ability to taste was, was actually, um, as it, as it came back, it was even weird until the apheresis. And then all of a sudden I was able to taste normally again. And uh, now I notice that I can smell things other people can't smell. Um, but the, the difference in the apheresis has been really, really dramatic for me. So to finish this whole presentation, I think that it's uh, very important to differentiate between health span and lifespan. Uh, as you can see here on this graph, as we age, uh, our uh, ability to fight off diseases increases. Uh, as you well know, very few people, if any, die of old age. Most people die of diseases. So if we can prevent diseases, uh, we will definitely increase lifespan. The other thing is lifespan has increased uh, in general dramatically over the last hundred years. However, people live longer, but they're not healthier. So uh, you may get to 100, but if you're in a wheelchair and look like this, I don't know if it's worth it. However, if we can prolong your health span so that you are able to enjoy yourself and do the things that you like, that's much more important. Uh, and this uh, is a statement that I firmly believe in, that the idea is to die as young as possible, as late as possible. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button for any new video release notifications. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well, and we'll speak to you again soon.